So Rudy, welcome to Bringing Stats Alive. Uh, we've got you in to talk about a paper that you recently published entitled Exploring UK Millennials' Social Media Consumption Patterns and Participating in Elections, mm -hmm. Activism and Slacktivism, published in Social Science Computer Review. Um, can you take us through um, what the goal of the paper was? What are you trying to find out? What's the mm -hmm. backdrop? Sure. Well, um, there were sort of a couple of things that are happening around this time. Um, uh, that all had to do with sort of the, the role of social media in um, uh, in helping to sort of democratize, and particularly you who have been sort of uh, typically disengaged from um, electoral politics and general politics uh, for the last thirty years. So most of the sort of the longitudinal trends indicate that this is what's been happening. Um, and then sort of the Tunisian and the Egyptian revolution happened, uh, and all of a sudden journalists, in particular, who seem to just get away with saying whatever they want without any empirical evidence. Um, uh, kept sort of insisting that social media, you know, had a big role uh, in this, and that it's going to help to sort of uh, upend this trend of sort of disengagement, and it's going to bring to life sort of new forms of democratic engagement, particularly among youth, right? And it's going to help them to sort of uh, become much more active. Um, and I sort of uh, found this to be very sort of dubious and kind of very suspicious reasoning given the types of activities that happen online and given that there's no necessary correspondence between clicking like on a Facebook post and then actually you know going out to vote or to you know protest or you know get beat up by the cops. All these things take significantly more commitment than anything that one does online. Uh, and so I want to say okay well let, let, let's see what's happening. Uh, and so when you get a look at the literature right the initial studies are all very positive. But then when you actually start to look at the uh, at, 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 uh, the variance explained by social media, it becomes very clear that's not that much. And then when you take a look at the outcome of the dependent variables, which is political participation, you'll see that a lot of them conflate online and offline political participation, which I suspect would increase the, you know, the, the R-square, the coefficient of determination, because you're conflating, again, clicking like on a Facebook post with uh, organizing a protest, right, or you know, getting arrested for some type of civil disobedience. And these are fundamentally different things, um, but if you put them together uh, and participants, you know, uh, tick one out of the 12 that you, that you give them, um, then yeah, you're probably going to get some spurious correlation. Um, and so I decided, okay, well, let, let's see what's happening, and we can start by um, uh, two ways. First, um, let's, let's measure how they actually uh, encounter or, or uh, attend to political content online because up to now it's been uh, b based on self-reported measures and the measures are they're what they're what they are for you know uh, for exploratory research but they generally consisted of questions like you know how often do you look at political content on Facebook or uh, s s things to that sort of uh, 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 nature and it was only about two measures generally and so we get no idea of what they're actually looking at um, we have no real understanding of you know, how often they even do this, really. Uh, and so uh, we have sort of, uh, um, I think, measurement errors on both counts. And so uh, I wanted to do two things. One, let's introduce a little bit more ecological validity to this and see how they actually attend to political content online. And then let's see if that's actually related to two distinct forms of participation, one online and one offline. And then after that, let's see uh, whether there's a difference between typically engaged youth and typically disengaged youth. Uh, and that's sort of the purpose of, the, uh, of my study. So Rudy, can you talk about the, uh, the method of the study and also the main findings? Yeah, um, so to again, to sort of um, uh, uh, input a degree of ecological validity, knowing that it's still very crude and very limited, um, I sort of developed a web survey. And the good thing about the web survey method in this particular context is that it's very suitable to uh, to online participation so that you can modify it relatively, you know, uh, well. Um, so that actually mimics real life settings. Right? You can't really do that with anything else, so it's kind of uh, unique to this context. Um, in addition to that, I created these sort of, um, these like Facebook simulations and Twitter simulations uh, that corresponded to different types of political activities and had some sort of control variables in there, like, um, like celebrity content. Um, and so I input these into the web survey and I had participants sort of, you know, I asked them questions like which one of these three would you most likely share, which one of these three would you most, you know, like, uh, likely, you know, click like on, which one of these three would you most likely read. And so I had like 12 of these, I put them in counterbalance order to make sure that the ordering didn't matter, didn't affect uh, anything. Um, and participants were, I guess, allowed to click whichever they want. So it gives us a better indication of the type of content that they're actually 
more likely to spread and more likely to actually pay attention to. Again, very limited, uh, only 12 items, but it was a start. And I think it did add some form of ecological validity to it. Um, and then I split the dependent measure into two, two different indices of political participation. So one was for offline, um, uh, which is things like um, uh, organizing a protest, uh, going to meetings, um, these types of measures, um, and online political participation, which is the typical or also known as slacktivism, um, where, again, you uh, share a post, a political post online, uh, you email a friend about a political event, things like that. And when you did that, when you actually sort of divide the two, um, the two types of participation, uh, and when you sort of correspond that to what they're actually more likely to attend to online, um, you get, I think, more realistic, or at least more, uh, 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 yeah, more realistic results. So you get that, um, yeah, they're more likely to, uh, if they pay attention to stuff online, that's related to online participation. But it doesn't really seem to do much for offline participation. Um, and that's kind of the general uh, finding. And studies since mine, I think it's six or seven now, um, in the same area, different measures, but are increasingly finding the same thing. That, yeah, it explains about 3% of the variance um, in um, uh, online participation. So it's doing something for that appreciable, still not that much even on that perspective. But it really does almost nothing for offline participation. Um, the hypothesis now is that hopefully, maybe in the long term, online participation will at some point uh, segue into offline participation. Uh, but I'm concerned that it might do the opposite, that the more they're engaged in online participation and, and very low cost, uh, no commitment, that they're going to get used to that and they're going to think that, well, that's it, I, I, I shared my post, I did my bit, I don't have to do anything else. Um, more research will have to be done on that, but I, I am concerned that it's actually going to have the opposite the, and, and a more negative effect up until now where it's been at least uh, insignificant. So an important part of um, understanding a, a, a data set is getting to grips with uh, variation in key measures. Um, and this is where the stats course that, that uh, we run in media and communications begins with, descriptive statistics. Um, in the course we talk about how to use numbers but also how to use graphs to um, highlight and describe variation in key variables. So can we just talk a little bit about the measures of offline practices and the measures of online slacktivist practices? What questions did you use? Uh, how did you um, try to understand variation in answers to these questions? Sure. Um, first, like, like anything else, I guess I encourage students to consistently do is obviously refer to literature, right? Um, uh, make sure that uh, you understand what others have sort of measured uh, before you start to um, uh, get too uh, inventive um, uh, or, or speculate too heavily. And so I mostly look at what other sort of uh, um, uh, studies in this area have done, in addition to general political participation questions that are usually asked. Um, and I sort of kind of split the two. I'm like, okay, well, we can have some um, uh, uh, items related to just specifically to online and some just specifically to offline. Now, some of these will, you know, they have correspondence, you know, they, 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 they will, um, and then we'll have an online sort of counterpart or vice versa. Uh, and then what I did, there was a mistake that I did, was, um, and this is why, again, background research is necessary, is uh, initially I had sort of um, uh, registering to vote um, as in offline uh, participation uh, because um, it's an indicator of, of pretty much that you're going to vote. Um, uh, but I forgot or I didn't understand at that point that you can do that online in the UK. So I then had to sort of... Uh, take that uh, that measure as a sort of its own separate um, uh, uh, component. Um, but for the other ones, so for online participation, for example, um, I asked them, and I spread this across the survey so that um, uh, uh, to avoid um, overstuffing or over selecting. Um, and some of the questions, for example, for offline, were you know, uh, did you uh, 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 campaign for a politician, right? or a political party, um, that you uh, attend a meeting uh, hosted by environmentalists or human rights groups, uh, things like that. Did you hope to organize political um, uh, demonstration? Did you attend a political protest? No. For online participation, it was things like, you know, sign an online petition, uh, click like on a political image or story, uh, use social media to spread information about a political event. Yeah. And so these are spread across the survey. 
Uh, and then once I got them, I, it was just a simple matter of just adding the frequencies, right? Just adding, uh, see how much of these individual um, items uh, did participants uh, sort of um, uh, report that they actually uh, engaged in. Uh, and so that gives us kind of a really good spread and a really good variation of the types of activities that uh, uh, this particular sample from this particular age group um, uh, reported doing more often. And so we get a good spread uh, and we can clearly see that obviously that um, uh, online participation activities are considerably higher. Right? We still now obviously are going to have to go to the next step of demonstrating or, uh, or testing whether or not these differences are statistically significant. But just based on the pure descriptives and the frequencies alone, we can see that, yeah, there's a massive difference between online and offline. So really, you've measured offline practices, you've measured online selectivist practices, um, you've taken a look at the raw frequencies for each of these variables, mm -hmm. you've created uh, an index of offline practices, you've created an index of online selectivist practices, essentially you've calculated the mean of people's answers to these, these questions. Mm -hmm. What do you do next? Talk us through uh, why you uh, turn to linear regression um, and what does that by us. Sure. And so, and so, yes, I created the index, right? And that's just um, a fancy way of saying I added all of these things together into a composite variable, right? So I had my, my dependent variables, one was online, uh, my other dependent variable was offline, and then I had to split um, uh, uh, registering to vote as a separate predictor. Okay? So I had these three kind of um, um, dependent um, variables. Uh, and then I sort of said, okay, well now we need kind of a, uh, uh, let's see how different uh, predictors, different uh, variables uh, can help to basically predict uh, uh, these uh, um, uh, dependent variables. Right? So um, I started off again by reading the literature and understanding that there are some well-known established predictors. There's some demographic predictors, gender, socioeconomic status, uh, political interest. Uh, political ideology, political socialization, these sort of standard psychographic and demographic factors generally predict participation in some form. So we're going to uh, control for that, right? That is to say, I want to, let, let's take away the effect of that or let's more or less, uh, and see just purely what social media uh, uh, participation or, or social media use, how much social media use can uh, explain uh, online and offline participation uh, uh, and, uh, and voting. Um, and the regression method really, really helps us to do that. And the particular one that I use, which is sort of called the hierarchical regression model, uh, which is not that complicated. It's actually very easy to do and very easy to do on SPSS. But uh, one of the sort of the, the uh, key attributes of that is that it allows you to see how much of the variance each one of these sort of blocks um, uh, explains. So you can actually see how much social media uh, contributes by itself, how much uh, gender contributes by itself when you isolate all of the other sort of demographics. Now, something that I should have done in this paper, and that I didn't because it was my first quant paper, so I did a lot of um, sort of rookie mistakes, um, uh, is that I should have uh, uh, created a, a, a different block just for social media use, just to see how much variance that explains. And I think I did end up doing that at some point, uh, and it was still, it was like 3%, or <laughs> something like that. Um, but so the regression method allows us to do that, right? It allows us to see um, uh, how much of, of uh, online political participation or offline political participation can be explained by these different uh, variables. Um, and sure enough, when you do that and when you isolate them, you start to see that again, that uh, typical established predictors like political interest, political ideology, uh, gender, socioeconomic status, these are what explain most of the variance in uh, political participation and that social media contributes. It is significant, but it is sort of a marginally significant uh, uh, effect. Um, and you get this consistently now across several studies, um, leading us now to suggest, I think, uh, that it's not having much of an effect in, in participation. So Rudy, you're using regression modeling um, to analyze observational data. Can you talk us through some of the strengths and limitations of that approach? Correlation does not equal causation, etc. No, absolutely, and this is a, you know, it's a cross-sectional study, it's a sample of 271. I maintain that the sample is fairly diverse, uh, even for an undergraduate sample, which is always, you know, one of the, uh, the major limitations of most research is that we generally just run this on our students, right? <laughs> um, but uh, in this particular case, it's relevant because this is the, the group that is supposed to be the one that's most engaged online and that we want to be politically engaged. So, um, that said, yeah, the extent to which uh, you can demonstrate uh, even remote you know, conclusiveness that uh, a correlation between two variables, you know, that one causes the other, 
not possible. Um, and here, you know, we, we, I, I run the risk of, you know, there's a reverse um, uh, 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 causality, which I can't sort of uh, correct for. Now that said, it's still a really, really powerful sort of a, a methodology because it does allow you to see, one, to test whether there's a relationship in the first place. And then you can use, obviously, some common sense and just some general sort of theoretical reasoning to suggest that there should be um, a relationship between the two. People weren't using social media when they were infants, right? They started using this later. Um, and so we can assume that, you know, that uh, uh, where these relationships, you know, start to, uh, uh, to appear. We can also start to compare it and we can see how other cross-sectional studies and see that they're, uh, what they sort of uh, find. And when you start to sort of add up all of this data together, it starts to paint a bigger picture of what's happening. And we also get another thing called sort of the, the in this case, the standardized coefficients, um, uh, which I use. And the good thing about those is that they allow us to see, uh, when, especially when you're using different types of scales and different types of measurements, right? You, need, you want to standardize them. Um, and what the standardized coefficients allow you to do is they allow you to see, uh, give you the relative strength, basically, of, of, uh, of each variable um, um, uh, in the regression model. And so when you sort of uh, talk about or look at all of these factors together, uh, you can get a better picture of, of, of why these correlations are happening. Right? And you do have to use some reasoning, obviously, in your own theoretical understanding uh, with reference to what you know, uh, experts in the field have said to contextualize uh, uh, and explain a kind of um, your interpretation of the findings. But yes, correlation is significantly and considerably limited. That said, it's unfortunately one of the only methods we have available to us right now, but it's also still a very powerful one. Uh, and it does have um, um, a degree of predictive power. I think.